My name is Angela Ferrelli. I'm an agent associate at the University of Maryland uh, here with my colleague uh, Carol Allen, who is the other agent associate at the University of Maryland, and we are both uh, food safety educators. So our job is to provide all the growers in Maryland the education that you guys need and want and the technical assistance that you also need to be able to navigate these murky waters of food safety, uh, both in audits and in the um, federal regulations. So today, hopefully, I'm going to be um, demystifying some parts of this and giving you some updates from the work that the Maryland Department of Ag and we have done in the last year to get you uh, ready for the produce safety rule. So has anyone gone through uh, a third party audit process in this room? One, gotten GAP certification? Yes, Couple? Maryland, okay. A couple got gap certification. Has anyone um, had a PSR inspection this year from MDA? Or an on farm readiness review? Okay. Is anyone a little bit confused about how those two things are different, the PSR and the gap? Okay, good, good. All right. Well, not. We're, hopefully, I will give you tips and tricks to try and negotiate both of those things. Um, and it is kind of hard to think about what the differences are between the two because at their core, they try and get at one, they try and, uh, and address one issue, right? So both of them outline practices for you to minimize the microbial hazards on your farm. But there are a lot of differences between the two. One is a voluntary process that you could undergo and one is a federal regulation. So in this talk, we're going to start with kind of looking at the differences between the two. Then I'm going to get a little bit into how to negotiate the audit process if you are interested in getting a GAP certification this year. Uh, then we're going to transition and talk about what's been going on in terms of the produce safety rule this year, how we're getting farmers ready, what we're seeing on the ground in Maryland, and um, just as to, to let you guys know, you guys are doing really well so far. Um, MDA is really pleased with how farmers in Maryland are farming um, and how they're uh, getting ready for the produce safety rule. So both of them require similar things. They both outline uh, different ways to minimize uh, microbial hazards on the farm, and they're focused on the farm elements that we know affect your product quality and safety the most. So that's all the workers that interact with your product. That's the water that you use to irrigate your product and wash your product and cool your product, if so. That's also any soil amendments that you're using on the farm. That's how you clean and sanitize the tools that you have on the farm and the equipment that you have on the farm. Um, and it also outlines practices for uh, how to deal with wildlife and other animals on the farm because we know that all of those things are really important in terms of your, your finished product quality and safety. And so you might be thinking in your seat right now, okay, well, if they both do most of the same things, why do we need both? Or why do we need either? So why would you need either, right? Having a formalized food safety plan and food safety culture on your farm is not only helpful to minimize those microbial risks, but it also opens up market access for you guys if you formalize the plan and get a GAP certification. And then furthermore, we do know that a lot of the practices that we do for food safety on the farm are also really good horticultural practices too, so they also uh, not only minimize your uh, microbial human pathogen risk, but also in some cases plant pathogen risk as well. Um, so it's always good to double dip. Now, why both? So as I had mentioned before, the GAP program is a voluntary program. The FISMA PSR is a mandatory program. Buyers right now are only focused on the GAP program because that's the only thing that gives you a paper certificate that a buyer can see. And it's very unlikely in the next few years that buyers are going to go with anything food safety without a paper certificate attached to it, right? So the GAP certifications are the only thing that's going to give you a, a paper um, assurance that you can hand to a buyer and that allows you to open up market access to different buyers. Um, but it's also, why both is also important because if you do GAPs and you follow good agricultural practices you get, you get a third party audit, it's very likely that you're well on your way to getting ready for the produce safety rule. So uh, we like to say that the GAP certification is like a stepping stone to the produce safety rule and in some cases, depending on what sort of GAP audit you want to target, if you're following all of those um, 
all those standards in that particular gap audit, you are actually already completely aligned with the produce safety rules. So when you can double dip, please do so, because we don't want you to du duplicate efforts in any way. So a little bit into how they're different. Um, this is only going to touch on a few things of how they're different. If you are interested in reading how the gap audits and the produce safety rule inspections are really different, um, University of Maryland Extension and the Agricultural Law Education Initiative came up with this really great handout that goes into a lot of detail into the differences and the similarities. Um, they're available. I have them here. I'll have them in the back table across the wall over here if you would like to take and read some more. They're also available online because there are a lot of links associated with this table as well. But as I mentioned before, number one, uh, the GAP audit program is a voluntary program dictated by what your buyer market uh, wants, and the produce safety rule is mandatory. Um, under the produce safety rule also, Maryland Department of Ag is rolling out a registration for growers. So every grower in the state of Maryland is going to have to register with the Maryland Department of Ag, and that's just so the Maryland Department of Ag can um, uh, kind of figure out where they need to put you in terms of when you're going to be inspected in the produce safety rules. So if you're a grower that's growing under $500,000 worth of produce, um, you're going to be inspected either this year or, or the next year. But if you're a grower who it has not been inspected yet and is growing over $500,000 worth of produce, once you get registered, you're going to be put up in the priority list for an MDA inspection. And they're not scary at all. We'll get into them at the, at the end of this, at the end of this, um, at the end of this talk. Um, so covered produce, so again, because the GAP audit is a voluntary program, you dictate to the auditor what sort of products you want uh, GAP certified. So if you are a farmer and you have apples and you have kale for pick your own and then you have sweet corn, you can choose to just get a GAP audit and a GAP certification just for the apples so that the auditor only goes out and takes a look at what the practices are with your apples. That's different from the produce safety rule. The produce safety rule, uh, MDA, um, inspector is going to come out and take a look at your practices that pertain to all the crops that are eaten raw on your, on your property. So in that same example of having apples and kale and sweet corn, they're going to look at the apples and the kale because both of those are eaten raw. And they're not going to be as, um, they're not going to look at your practices regarding sweet corn. Um, so exemptions to this rule, the next part down here, uh, under the voluntary program, you can be exempt uh, based on what your buyer, uh, what your buyer requirements are. So there, I know I do know some buyers in some grocery stores will allow you to start uh, selling to them if you don't have an audit yet, but with a written assurance that you're going to get an audit in the next year or so. So you could kind of work with your buyer on the expectations they have with you. Exemptions on the produce safety rule, because this is a federal regulation, the exemptions are real complicated and real murky, and every single one of them has a record um, associated with it. So I'm going to just briefly talk about it here. But if you think that you might be exempt, or if you think that you might be qualified exempt, talk to me after this talk, or we could talk to Carol as well. So if you're a farm that's growing under $27,000 worth of produce a year, you can be exempt. And there is a registration associated with each one of these, right? So there's a registration associated with if you're growing under $27,528 of produce. <laughs> it's adjusted for inflation each year, which is our job to keep up on so we can let you know. Um, if, you, if all the produce on your farm is all going to further processing, there's a specific exemption for that. So let us know if you're growing, all you're growing is spinach and it's getting canned. Let us know. We can direct you to the right registration form to fill out for that. Uh, the last one is if everything you're growing on your farm is, is um, not eaten raw, so if you're just doing a whole farm full of winter squash for some reason, then you can be, uh, that crop is rarely eaten raw, and there's another potential exemption that you can apply for for that. Okay, so those are the exemptions. If you are a farmer that may find yourself in the category of selling between $27,000 a year in produce and $550,000, $551,000, $550,000, yeah. Mm -hmm. Don't forget that one. That, that one is important. So if you're between $27,000 and $550,000, 
then you could potentially be under a qualified exemption that you could apply for a qualified exemption. So in addition to your produce sales, if you're in that bracket, you're going to also want to roll in any other food sales that you have. So that involves any livestock that you're selling, any um, jams or jellies that you're selling as well. So you roll in all the other food that you're selling and who that food is being sold to. Um, so it gets very complicated. We're not going to go into it at this talk. Um, but if you think that you are between 27 and 550 of produce and you think you want to apply for a qualified exemption, um, then come talk to me afterwards. We'll get you all situated. Basically, what you're going to have to do is keep sales records of all the food you're selling and who you're selling it to to maintain to MDA that you are still within this uh, structure to be qualified exempt. And you'll have to keep those records for three years, okay? Or you can just choose to be fully covered and uh, you will be in the bank of farms that MDA will come out and inspect if you don't want to go through all that. Uh, all that record keeping, you can choose to do that. As I mentioned before, um, with, a, a, with the voluntary audit, you are gonna get a paper certificate of compliance, and this is what buyers really like to see, and there's no sort of paper certificate of compliance associated with a PSR inspection. Other general differences, um, if anyone's familiar, who is familiar with the food safety plan? Who has written a food safety plan? Okay, cool, all right, okay. So um, for your gap audits, you have to have a written food safety plan that an auditor will come and take a look at what sort of practices, policies, and procedures you have in place on your farm. And for the produce safety rule, it's not really required to do that, but it's recommended because it just keeps everybody more organized and it keeps the inspector on your farm for a shorter amount of time if you have everything organized into a, a written plan. Um, for traceback and recall, uh, some of the audits uh, outline that you should have a trace back and recall plan. So this means that you have a lot system for your products and you know you can trace it back from uh, where it was in the field and trace it forward to where it's going to specific buyers. Uh, so some audits require that. The MDA gap audit does not, which is the uh, baseline type of audit that you can get. Um, it's, it, this is also not required for the produce safety rule unless you're doing some on-farm processing like making um, ciders or jams or jellies or something like that. Um, the record keeping is various between the two. Uh, there are six required records for the produce safety rule and we'll get into what is um, needed on those records in a little bit. Uh, and when we get there, I would recommend that everybody take a look and just add the things that are required for the produce safety rule on whatever record that you are already doing so that you don't have to create two records for the same thing, right? There are some easy ways that you can comply with the produce safety rule with things that you already have. And then just kind of rounding us out, um, the produce safety rule is just focused on microbial hazards. It doesn't talk about chemical and physical hazards. However, in audits, you're going to have to want to keep a record of the pesticide applicator license and um, other verbiage about how you're mitigating chemical and physical hazards. Okay, so into the different gap audits that you can pursue if you would like to, uh, depending on if you want to open up market access to different buyers and different wholesale opportunities. Um, they range from less intensive to most intensive. Um, uh, and the, different, the intensity of the audit kind of just goes with how many more paper records you're going to have to keep. Uh, the practices are very, very similar among all of these. Uh, as I had mentioned before, they all outline practices around workers' fertilizer, water quality, maintaining and testing water quality, uh, your cleaning and sanitizing schedules for your tools, equipments, and your building, uh, how you're inspecting different trucks that are coming onto your property to haul pro produce, um, temperature controls, and monitoring for animals. So if you have not done a gap audit before and you would like to get into this world of gap audits, I would really recommend starting with an MDA gap. It requires the least amount of records and the least amount of time to get you started. It's very likely that you're already doing most of these practices that is outlined in an MDA gap audit. You just got to write it all down in a way that an auditor can take a look at and give you a passing grade on, right? And there's also some records required to it. Getting, getting used to starting to um, put records together is is a bit of a hurdle, but once you're once you're started with records, it's a lot easier to keep going with record keeping. 
Um, if you're interested in some of these more intense audits, uh, they're going to include different parts in a uh, produce safety um, in a produce safety plan. Some of them require written risk assessments, so how you know when you're going out to a field it's ready for harvest. Some of those audits require a, a record associated with, I know my field is now ready for harvest. Again, it's things that you're already doing. The auditor just wants it in paper form now, uh, which is quite laborious. I definitely understand that. Uh, they also want things outlined like different defense plans, uh, corrective action plans. So again, something that you're probably already doing. You probably already have a plan in place for if a porta potty falls over or if you see a worker who is just not washing their hands ever, right? What the plan in place is is that you're going to go over to that person and retrain them, right? And in these different audits, they're... they're um, in these more intense audits, they're just asking that that's written down and formalized in paragraph form. Uh, which Carol and I can help you do. Um, if you are interested in getting an audit, so MDA can come out and perform any of these audits here. They're, they're not going to come out and perform the global gap audit. Um, but MDA can come out and perform all these audits. And in 20, the 2020 year is a good time to get an audit done because a lot of those, um, because of MDA, uh, has found funds for them to be either free or for you to get reimbursed. So the MDA gap audit is free. Um, if you'd like to get an HGAP audit, there's 100% reimbursement on that audit, so it's also free. Um, you can get cost share for any group gap, op, group gap audits you're looking to get, and if you are interested in the harmonized gaps, um, there is a reimbursement for the first $400 of certification and 75% of costs over $400. So this year is a good year to pursue this because I'm not sure if these funds are going to be available in next year's. Uh, so. Um, now's the time to do it. Um, the stars over here uh, go to the fact that some of these audits are fully aligned with the produce safety rule, meaning that if you're completing all of these things for this particular audit, you're also aligned for everything underneath the produce safety rule. And then also for uh, those bigger farmers, if you are selling to a larger grocery store like Wegmans or Walmart, or if you would like to sell internationally, there are audits that MDA can perform for you that are global GFCI equivalent, global food safety initiative equivalent. So that's available to you. All right, so if you're sitting in your seat and you're saying, okay, this is all well and good, but I don't know what the steps to actually get this done are, the first thing that you're going to need to do is designate it, be someone's job on the farm to be a food safety officer, and that person is going to be record man number one unfortunately or fortunately, if they like records, right? So, um, and then we, uh, you go to a food safety training, you have that appointed person go to a food safety training. There are multiple throughout the state of Maryland that we're doing this year. We do them every winter. Um, however, if we get a quorum of farmers who are like, we would like a, a gap class in the fall, we would also hold one in the fall. It's based on availability and interest. Um, so you'll go to a food safety training. You'll start writing down the guts of your food safety plans. As I mentioned before, these are all your written policies. They're going to be your records. They're going to be any SOPs that you have. And they're going to be any risk assessments that you're making and any plans that you have in place in case things go wrong. So that is all included in the guts of a food safety plan. You'll keep things like your pesticide applicator license in there. You'll keep things like your water testing report in there. Um, risk assessments, as I had said before. Then what you're going to want to do is start trying to uh, see how what you wrote down is actually aligning with the practices you do on your farm because auditors will, uh, the audit goes off of based what you're writing down that you're saying. So if you're writing it down, you should do it. And if it's something that you're not doing on your farm, don't write it down because that's a way that an auditor will ding you, right? They grade you off based off of what you're saying you're doing. Um, it's also a good idea to, to have a day where you're a mock auditor yourself and you go out to your workers and you see if they're following the practices that you're, you wrote down that you said you're doing. And it gives you a little bit of an opportunity to kind of self-evaluate and um, augment the plan or your records or anything before an auditor comes. And then you want to schedule and pass a third party audit. Uh, when can you call Carol or myself to help you through this? You can call us during almost every single part of the process. We cannot be the auditor for you. Unfortunately, we would love to be. But if you have any questions about how to develop SOPs, if you want second eyes reviewing a food safety plan, if you're not sure how to write a food safety plan, um, please get up with us. We can definitely help you. Because it's, 
having a written food safety plan is a great way to grow your business. Um, so you can get a bunch of templates online for food safety plans. The MDA uh, has a template food safety plan. That's a good plug and chug. Uh, there's also, for those growers who are interested in HGAP, a, a, a more stringent type of gap audit, um, there's a, a template from the, well, there's a handbook on how to write your plan from the uh, Carolina Farm Stewardship Association. There's also a good plug and chug template from the Produce Safety Alliance that I can send to Mike and he can send out to people if they're interested. That's another really good plug and chug one. Um, hmm? Yeah, yeah, that's Produce Safety Alliance. Well, yeah, it's Cornell, the Cornell Gap Program. Yes, thank you, Carol. Um, as I had mentioned before, keep it simple and easy to follow. Uh, structure it based on what the auditor, how the auditor is going to go through your farm. So there are different scopes that are uh, required in each of the, the audits. And just have your verbiage structured exactly like that, because you don't want that person on your farm any longer than they need to be. Uh, use tables liberally. Like when you don't have to write a paragraph, you don't need to. You can use a table if it's easier. Uh, and other sort of conventions like bolding. As I mentioned before, it's not a wish list, so just write down everything that you are doing and things that you're not doing, don't write it down. And um, make sure even with these, if you're using a plug and chug, that you're erasing the things that are not happening on your farm, or if they cover a different type of crop, you're making sure that it's tailored to the crop that you are uh, writing the plan for. Um, so this is a great way, it's an example to um, put verbiage in a food safety plan that covers many different bases at once in two paragraphs. And feel free to take a picture of this. I got this from Penn State, and it talks about animal control. So if you see here, they have a couple of elements that I think are really nice all in two paragraphs. They have their written policy about what they do for animals. We do all that we can to keep up domestic and wild animals out of the fields, right? So that's a check, check mark off that. They have a monitoring log. They reference a monitoring log in here, right? We routinely monitor the growing area, and the results are recorded in our monitoring log. They have, because this is off of a more stringent audit, this is not off an MDA gap audit, they have an allusion to a written risk assessment. Um, again, if you're going for an MDA gap audit, this does not need to be in here. But they talk about that they include an inspection for the presence of animals during your pre-harvest risk assessment. And then they also outline the plan that they're going to enact in case something other than uh, something non-normal happens. So if they find significant evidence of poop in the field, they outline that what they do is mark off the area with a buffer and they don't harvest crop within that buffer and it's removed. So this is a really efficient way to get all of the elements of a food safety plan in paragraph form. And I would really recommend working off this template because it's, it's just the easiest way to do it. And Carol, Carol and I have experience in this. It can help you help you move through this. Kind of on records, as I mentioned before, uh, take a look at all the records that you have right now. And we would recommend just making them produce safety rule compliant. And to make them produce safety rule compliant, you're just going to have to add a couple of these little elements here. You're going to want to add on all of your records the name and address of your farm. Uh, all the records have to be done at the, uh, dated at the exact time that they're done. Uh, the date is sufficient. Um, they also going to, in, in different things like cleaning and sanitizing, uh, produce safety rule records want you to outline what methods you're using. So you, in this example, it is writing out what the method is, but we all know we don't have time for that. So what you could do instead is you could reference an SOP up top here, and you could just reference, like, everyone was trained in this specific way to clean and sanitize things. Reference the SOP, and this could be a check mark. You could say clean and sanitizing um, uh, Harvest Knives SOP, right? Um, the other thing that produce safety rule records need um, is that they are at the end of the record. You know, you have your worker signing them. And at the end of the record, the food safety officer is going to want to review them, title them, and date them. All right? So what can Carol and I help you with? Well, we can help you write your food safety plan. We can help review your food safety plan. We can take a look at your practices that you're doing on the farm. You can have us out. We can take a look and prioritize what different things you're going to want to target for this year in your food safety goals. Um, we can help you interpret uh, water test results or get your water testing uh, 
program started if you haven't already started it. And then furthermore, we can also help you devise a cleaning and sanitizing program for different tools and equipment on your farm. So if you're not sure what things you should be cleaning and sanitizing or how often you should be doing it or how you need to be recording it or if it's effective, um, let us know and we can come out and help you with that. There are also uh, a bunch of resources both around the country and in Maryland that you could take advantage of to help you with your food safety goals. As I mentioned, there's a template for pretty much anything you could ever want. Um, there are a lot of signs that we made, and some of these signs suffice the recommendation, or sorry, the requirements for the produce safety rule. There's a visitor sign. Uh, so especially those of you who ha have uh, pick your owns, I would recommend getting one of these signs. So this outlines the policies that a visitor should be following when they come to your farm. It talks about not picking when sick, not bringing their pets, not bringing food and drink into the field, washing their hands, and uh, farm kid safety. I think it says on here, plants are not toys, which I really like. Um, so I have these available out here. I have like six available and we can order more. So they're all free for you for taking if you would like to have one. Uh, we have other signs as well. Um, also, uh, we have worker training supplements. So the produce safety rule not only wants you to show the Cornell video to have all your workers trained in, in um, hygiene, but they also want your workers trained in doing their specific jobs. So Maryland Department of Ag actually came up with four uh, PowerPoints and uh, videos that are in English and Spanish, both for harvest training, post-harvest training, working with animals, and general food safety. So you can show these to your workers, and that will uh, suffice the other requirement of training for the produce safety rule. And then. Uh, we can also provide the resource of tra uh, tailored training to your needs. That's where the, um, the survey comes in. So our survey is the yellow one in your little booklet. And we really appreciate if you fill this out. This lets us know what types of uh, training topics you would like to have in this area and where in this area is most convenient for you for us to come train. Um, so please fill this out. I'll be collecting these at lunchtime. All right, back with the PSR, compliance dates for the produce safety rule. So if you're a grower that's growing over 500,000 worth of product, expect that um, the MDA will be calling you soon to get an inspection. Um, if you're a grower that is growing between $250,000 of product and $500,000 of product, this year is the year that you're going to be inspected. And then small businesses between 25 and 250, you've got till next year. Um, again, as I mentioned in the top, if you think, if you're someone that's between $27,000 and $500,000 worth of produce and you think you might want to apply for this exemption, I would recommend start keeping sales records now of the food and produce that you're selling and who it's getting sold to because MDA, the Maryland Department of Ag, is going to want to take a look at those records next year. So what is MDA and uh, Carol and I currently doing to help everybody get ready for the produce safety rule? Uh, we're holding PSR trainings, uh, so the produce safety rule trainings. These are a federal requirement that every food safety officer in a farm uh, goes to one of these trainings. Uh, we have one coming up in McHenry, Maryland, which is all the way west. Um, so that will be the end of these trainings for this year, but uh, let us know if you would like one over here in the late fall. We could start doing that for you, or, or when else would be efficient and effective for you guys to get a training. Um, we are conducting on-farm readiness reviews. So an on-farm readiness review is a confidential program that uh, Maryland Department of Ag and the University of Maryland is doing where we come out to your farm and we take a look at your practices and we can let you know where you're already aligning and things you need to prioritize to align better with the produce safety rule. It's completely confidential and we don't take any written notes off of the farm. We keep them all with you. And on the whole, Maryland's been doing really well with these. 86% uh, of Maryland farms only needed to have minor changes but before they were completely aligned with the produce safety rule. And those minor changes are usually red tape things like the stuff on the records and doing a water distribution assessment, writing that down. So again, a lot of formal things. Um, but on the whole, you guys are doing really well. And we really commend you for keeping food safety in the forefront of your goals. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, MDA is inspecting the largest farms uh, this year. They are only, none of these inspections are unannounced. They're always going to call you up unless you are not returning their calls, then they might show up. Um, but 
they have not, the only thing that they're citing to the FDA are any egregious conditions that they find on the farm, and they have not found any egregious conditions in the state of Maryland, which is great. Um, they are providing you a summary report that's a non-federal uh, document, and that's just a report of things that you can work on this next year. And that's just for people who are getting inspected uh, what's been happening. Um, so I was able to get this information from one of the inspectors, Alec Lorenka from the MDA, and he let us know the different things that um, uh, need some work in general in Maryland for this next year. So uh, common observations that he saw when he was out doing produce safety rule inspections is that um, just to keep in mind, we really want you to be aware of all your tools and equipment that are food contact surfaces, and we want you to devise cleaning and, cleaning and sanitizing schedules for those tools and equipment, and it doesn't have to be after every use. This is, at, this is a schedule based on what the frequency you determine is, so it can be every month, it can be once a season, it's based on what works for your farm. Um, different cleaning procedures, we're still seeing, seeing a lot of people just spray sanitizer on a dirty belt and just say that that's what their cleaning procedure is and we really want you to follow a four step process of cleaning with a detergent and then sanitizing and then completely drying the piece of equipment. Drying is essential, we are finding in the research um, because microbes, whenever there is a, a water present, microbes really like to get into that niche and grow. So drying whenever possible your equipment is really important. Um, uh, soil amendment application, so if you're applying manure to a sweet corn field and you have melons within like 15 feet of that sweet corn field, just be aware of the different risks associated with that sweet corn field. If, there, if there's any way that runoff could happen and how you're going to mitigate potential risk of any uh, runoff. As I mentioned before, visitor policies and that sign that I have can shore you up on this visitor policies thing. Um, making sure that we have a plan in place for when wildlife comes on our farm and having workers trained for knowing how to deal with animals on the farm. As I mentioned before, Maryland Department of Ag on their website has a, a training that's in English and Spanish for working with animals. So I highly suggest getting to that website and showing your workers this. Um, from the HGAP, if you're, if you're a grower who wants to get one of the stringent audits for the HGAP, there are a couple of other things that Alec was noting in his inspections this year. Again, a lot of these, some of these are piddly things, some of these are red tape things, um, like securing chemical storage. Make sure, as was said in the last talk, uh, what, whatever sort of sanitizer or pesticide or whatever you're using, um, follow the label instructions. Um, that is the most important thing. And then you could take a picture of this. I think for time I won't be able to go through it all the way, but there are some things that you can prioritize that will cover uh, a PSR requirement and uh, a harmonized gap requirement, and that is making sure the records have all the required things on them, protecting your water source from source to spigot, um, keeping your harvest totes off the ground, and I know this is a hard one, and uh, research is still diving into the actual risk of uh, harvest totes in contact with soil, but if you have the ability to use a sacrificial tote when you're um, harvesting or if you could put a piece of cardboard underneath the tote that you're using to slide around the ground, we really recommend doing that if you can. Uh, if you're employing any sanitizers for water treatment activities, make sure that you're able to monitor, monitor the sanitizer with a pH or PPM strip. You can get these pH or PPM strips from brewery supply stores or restaurant supply stores. I have got one from Amazon and it did not work, so I would caution against using the Amazon ones. Um, and then if you are using a cooler, just be aware of what's going on with cooler condensate. We want, best case scenario is for the product, any product that you have, don't store it directly underneath the cooler. But if you are storing it directly underneath the cooler, I would recommend that you cover it with a plastic sheet or something so we don't have any condensate hitting the product. Um, all right, so things to think about now. We just want to make sure that everybody realizes that food safety is an iterative and continuative process, a continuing process. You're not going to get all your food safety goals done in one season. If you are thinking of where to start, we always recommend starting with worker training program because they affect your product quality and safety the most because they're touching it all the time. Um, 
And uh, if you are interested in going to a GAP training this year, we have a couple of advanced trainings happening March 28th, uh, nope, February 28th and March 4th. Uh, in these advanced trainings, we're going to get more in depth into uh, how to look at your piece of equipment for food safety risks, how to develop cleaning and sanitizing schedules, and if you're doing any sort of on-farm produce processing, how to, uh, how to know if you're edging into a different type of Food Safety Modernization Act rule. If you want more information on how to write your plan, we are hosting two basic GAP uh, pro, uh, workshops where we're going to be actually writing plans. So if you think you're ready to do this, but you just don't know how to write the thing, um, come to one of these programs. You'll leave with a plan almost done. Uh, go ahead and take a picture of this. These are references for further reading. All of the Maryland registration forms that I talked about are available here. And you could talk to Carol or myself to kind of navigate you through which form you need to fill out if you need to fill out one. And there are also uh, resources from the produce safety rule as well. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Did you get it? OK, good. And then um, if you have any questions, please reach out to us. And I'll take any questions you have. Great question. So they're still trying to figure out how often they're going to have to come out to give you a, 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 an inspection. Some smaller states are able to come out to their farms once a year. It's, quite, uh, it's going to be unlikely that MDA is going to be able to come out to you every year. I think they're thinking maybe, I don't want to give you a number, but maybe every three years. And it's going to be based on priority they're thinking too, so it won't be an annual thing. Uh, keeping track of uh, animals? Yeah. What happens when you live in the middle of the deer? Mm -hmm. You cross over mm -hmm. between one section to another. We're, we're right in the middle. Mm -hmm. There's no way to keep them out because mm -hmm. we got two highways mm -hmm. that you can't barricade them out. Um, you can't keep the raccoons out. You can't keep the groundhogs out. You can't keep the squirrels and the other wildlife out. That's a great question. So we hear this a lot. The wildlife is a real challenge, especially on the eastern shore, especially with all the deer we have. And I think that all the regulators and the auditors know that we're not going to be able to keep all of the animals outside of an outside space. Right? So this one is mostly a due diligence thing on you. It's, it's you're writing down that you're trying to monitor for them and you're trying your best to deter them from your production areas. But we know that wildlife are an integral and also beneficial part of a farm. So we're not trying to give you a prescription to, to get rid of all the deer, right? And we know that it's a challenge. And that's kind of one of those things where you do your best, and you write down what you're doing, and that's all you can do. Their big, their big problem is they decide they want to cross over 2, 3, 4 o'clock in the morning when mm -hmm. there ain't nobody around exactly. and it's pitch dark. That's exactly right. Yeah, and I just think, yeah, wildlife will always be a challenge. and. The, it's a good thing that the MDA auditors and inspectors, they know that. So they're not, they're not as um, persnickety as someone else in Rhode Island would be, unfortunately. Fortunately. Just a quickie. Yeah. You're on the wildlife. Is there one species of wildlife we should be more concerned about, the deer or the geese? Or like, are they all basically the same? Because you can find droppings of geese all over the place, especially you got a pond mm -hmm. nearby, mm -hmm. and deer, you got any woods nearby, they're all over it. And I guess it's just more critical to put up scare balloons or something for the geese or fencing for the deer. If, if, if you wouldn't have to choose one. Other. I know <laughs> some of the food safety <laughs> problems that have happened in California, mm -hmm. they're more worried about pigs mm -hmm. and animal, confined animal uh, uh, operations close to where you're, you're at. So. Yeah. That's a great question. So the question was, which animals should we m mitigate for most, right? Should it be the deer? Should it be the geese? Um, and I think y you can think about this two ways. You can think about it as what sort of animals you most likely see and how many of that sort of animal do you most likely see. So if you notice from your monitoring, because you're just looking at your, you're looking at your production area all the time, you notice that deer is the biggest problem, then you're going to want to try your best to control for deer. If you know that you've got a flock of geese and a flock of deer, 
it's kind of down to like, well, who's the bigger problem? Who goes into the field more often? Then I would prioritize that way. <laughs> it's just doing your best. They're animals. They're out there. We're not going to keep them from our delicious food, you know? Angela, I think you're seeing feral pigs in southern Maryland. Are we? Are we seeing any feral pigs? No? No, one farmer piped up and okay. at one of our trainings and said, hey, Well, let's there. hope not. Oh, yeah, no. The one uh, on the earlier, uh, there was one cats. example cat yeah. uh, manual. Yeah. This common line in probably an hour's two, it says you're going to flag off mm -hmm. places and you're going to compost three feet around mm -hmm. and all that. Um, I'm thinking in practice that doesn't happen. And I wonder. Can you write a manual without that in there, or? You're going to want to have to do something. You're gonna, you, you, you can do something. You could bury it. You could just flag it. You could remove it. The, the, the buffer is up to you. you it doesn't have to be three feet. It doesn't what? Just not picking that area isn't good enough. You can say that. But then what you're going to want to do is follow up that your workers know not to pick it in subsequent picks, like if they go into the field again. So you can write down, and that's where the kind of the flexibility comes into play. You can write down whatever works for your farms just as long as you can like back it up with worker trainings, right? And in that instance, someone will ask a worker, be like, how do you know if you're coming into this field a second time what to pick and what not to pick, right? And if they know, and if they can tell the, the inspector like, oh, I know, then you're golden. Make sense? Okay, thank you. Thank you.